Good morning, Grace Point family. Thank you once again for joining us online. We're so excited to be with you this morning in your house or on your laptop, however you're watching us today. We're glad that you've chosen to tune in and worship with us here with our church family. Uh, my name is Joel Craig. I'm the lead pastor here at Grace Point. If you're new or just kind of tuning in, we would love to get you better connected in this place. If you could just send us a personal message, a private message through our Facebook page, then we'll get you better connected with our Grace Point family here as we come to worship each and every week. And so we love you. We're glad you're with us. We're excited to sing together. I'm going to pray for us and we'll jump right in. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you in this place. God, I pray that you are honored and glorified in everything that we do. God, God, help us to eliminate all those things that are outside of you in this moment and just focus on who you are and what you mean to us. God, as we dive into your words, as we sit in your presence, God, be honored and glorified in all that we do and say. God, we love you and praise you. It's in your son's name that we do pray. Amen.
is destined the covenants of old your love is glory through the winter rain beyond the horizon thirst for today faithful you have been faithful you will be pledge yourself to me and it's why I see your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips. Your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips. Your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips. Your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips. Behind your 
mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and train them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh, oh come to Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in this place today. As we enter in today, Lord, to the rest of the service, we just bless your name. We praise your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Once again, thank you for joining us here today. Listen, if you had one wish, right, one wish, what would that be? Because if we're honest with each other, we've been wishing and hoping our entire lives from when we were little kids, either a birthday present or a Christmas present, we've been wishing for something to come along. And while those wishes and desires have kind of changed throughout our lives, it doesn't mean that we've stopped 
wishing and hoping and desiring for different things. They've just kind of shifted a little bit, right? It, it kind of changes from a bike to a car or from like a tree house to an actual house. Uh, maybe it's from McDonald's for dinner to like Ruth's Chris for dinner. I know that's a step up. I don't get that very often, but man, I, I love that place. That place is unbelievable. It, it changes from uh, wanting a girlfriend for the dance to uh, having a wife for life, right? And then it goes from having children, wanting to have children, to wanting to have adult children that you love living life with as well. All throughout our lives, we keep changing, and maybe it's gone from uh, just praying and wishing and hoping that these sniffles would go away, to now in the immediate praying God would just eradicate diseases and viruses from all over the world. Things have changed on our wish list, but it's always and forever a wish list for us, right? And so what would be the thing that you would ask for right now in this moment? If you had Will Smith standing next to you painted blue, what would be the thing that you asked for from the genie today? I used to love throwing coins into wishing wells. That was a a lot of fun for me. I I found out this week as I kind of researched what that actually came from was that it goes back a long, long ways into the original folklore uh, of people coming and throwing coins in, actually paying for gods that were sitting around that body of water or that well. They would throw coins to pay them so that they would actually grant their wish. And even when you go into like mythological backgrounds, it was something where they would throw coins in and depending on how the coin landed, whether it landed face up, that means you got your wish, or whether it landed face down, it means you got diddly squat from the god that was over that particular wishing well. And then kind of in Nordic mythology, uh, Odin was said to have have given his eye, he, he gouged his eye out and threw it into a wishing well, Mirmir's wishing well, uh, in order to be able to see into the future. He had to give something up in order to get something back from the gods. Well, God certainly isn't a wishing well or a genie in a lamp, to say the least, although many people have tried to place him within that category. He isn't here to cater to absolutely everything that we ask for or wish for by any means. But there are times in Scripture where we have to kind of adjust this a little bit and ask what is really going on here because you have to ask that question a few times. In the book of Psalms, it says that he will give us all of the desires of our heart, and that kind of pricks your memories, right? But it's coupled in this entire passage of talking about the desires of God's heart and being fully devoted and committed to him. And then our desires, when they're connected with his, would be met. In the New Testament, when Jesus says to ask, seek, and knock, our our student ministry just went through this right before our little break here, that, that we would ask and everything that would be given to us, but it's coupled in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is speaking specifically to be devoted to the kingdom of God, that we would continually seek and continually ask and continually knock for God's kingdom to be glorified. And then in the Gospel of John, where he says these things where it says, anything that you want in my name will be given to you. And so many of us like to just drop off that part where it says, in my name, because then it becomes a wish list and God is a genie in a bottle or a wishing well that we throw something at and hopefully we get what we want. But we do run into something that's like that today in our scriptures that you've been tracking through with us if you've joined us. And it's a case of Solomon. We're joining up with Solomon, King Solomon, as we walk through Scripture. So if you have your Scripture, turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. That's where we're going to start off today. 1 Kings chapter 3. We've been walking through the entire story of Scripture, and you hear this quite often. For those of you that are just joining us on this mission and on this journey of following through God's story, the last several weeks we've kind of gone through the very first kings of the nation of Israel as they kind of entered into the promised land and took over all of that territory. And then once they got settled and started moving away from God, then they had to have judges come in and kind of bring them back into a relationship with God. And then they'd fall, and it kind of became this vicious circle. And so they asked for God to give them a king, bring them somebody that would lead them. And just a couple of weeks ago, we talked about King Saul, and and he was the first king of Israel, but that didn't necessarily work out too well for them or him. 
And then the last couple of weeks, we talked about King David. If you remember, David was a shepherd boy who, who, who took down a giant and then becomes king over the nation of Israel, known as the greatest king in the nation of Israel. And so he lived up to that hype, but then there's one moment of weakness, which we talked about just last week, where he kind of screws up royally. See what I did there? I know, I still got preacher's jokes for days, right? But then he lives out the rest of his life kind of dealing with those consequences as honoring to God as he possibly could within his life. And now today we enter into the kingdom and the kingship of Solomon. We walk under what Solomon's reign looked like. You see, Solomon was one of David's sons. David had 20 different sons by several different women. But Solomon was the last son given to him by Bathsheba, and you'll remember that name from our story from last week as well. Uh, This was the last son that she gave to David. And this is that same line, that same line that we've talked about all along, that this is the line that will eventually lead us all the way down to Jesus. And so it comes through King David, and it comes through King Solomon and Bathsheba, and it leads all the way down to Jesus. Because if you remember, the very beginning of our journey through Scripture, you need to know It always leads to Jesus. Everything that we study, everything that we read in Scripture leads to Jesus. King Solomon was a part of that journey. But as Solomon establishes his kingdom now, and it certainly wasn't easy with all of those different brothers trying to vie for the attention and take over the kingdom in the midst of it, David comes along and he says, Solomon, you are going to be the next king. You have been anointed by me to be the next king, and I give you now my blessing." And so in chapter 3, early on in the kingship of Solomon, he has this interaction with God. And this is where we want to dive into it today. So 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5 and following, it says this. It is written, it is written, at Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. There's that little phrase, right? Notice that even in the midst of this statement where we think, oh, he just can get whatever he wants to, there's no guarantee here. He just says, ask for whatever you want me to give to you. Just ask for it and we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see how this thing plays out. Continuing on, it says, Solomon answered, Lord, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David. Because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart, you have continued this great kindness to him him, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen. And they are a great people, too numerous to count or number. That word great means actually heavy. It's not just the numbers, but it was the weight of leading this enormous group of people. It was a a huge task, a huge ask for someone to come and lead this people. He says, so give your servant a discerning heart. This is what he asks of God. Give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Verse 10, the Lord was pleased with how Solomon, or what Solomon had asked for. And isn't it better to be pleased by God than to be displeased by what we choose, which is what David walked through just last week, remember? And so God says to him, after acknowledging he's pleased with what happened here, he says, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never, be, never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, So that in your lifetime you will have no equal among the kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. You see, God goes above and beyond here. Solomon asks for wisdom, he asks for discernment here, but not only does he get that, God says, I'm so pleased with you answering this question in that way that I'm going to give you that, and then go, a ridiculous amount of wealth is going to come your way. 
And then there's going to be honor that comes with the, the surrounding countries and all of the world's going to know who you are and respect who you are and you're going to have all of this wealth and honor that comes along with the wisdom that you so desired. It's almost like that old TV show, Let's Make a Deal. Now, now most of you may know that from Wayne Brady, who's the host now, but I'm a, I'm a Monty Hall guy from back in the day. I know it's a little old school, but that's when I was watching it. And let's make a deal. There was a, a moment where you'd open up the curtain and there was this beautiful thing and it was great and everybody was happy. But then there was this little side thing that was like, oh, and by the way, here's $10,000. And you're like, yeah, this is amazing, right? You ask for one thing, but then it's revealed that you have all of the rest of this that comes your way. Because, listen, Solomon is overwhelmed by this gift from God. But you and I should be exactly the same. Because while we are asking for all sorts of different things, we should be overwhelmed with the type of gift that we understand comes from God, and that's the overwhelming gift of Jesus Christ. While we may ask for all these different things, and, and he gives some of those things to us and other things he's kind of held back from us, we always have that hidden curtain that's pulled back that says, oh my goodness, the curtain is ripped in two from the cross of Jesus Christ, and now whatever gift that comes our way, whatever grace that we received is in his name and justified through our relationship with him. And so God is an overwhelming gift giver. No matter what you have received and have not received, God is an overwhelming gift giver because God's overwhelming gift is Jesus. You may pray, God, give me smartness, please, <laughs> right? Who knows how God could use that statement in our lives? God, would you just help me with discernment? Help me figure this out. What he would use that to accomplish the things that are going on in our lives, the lives of, of those that are around you, how he could use that in the midst of us working with him. So my goodness, could we just spend some time Literally in the midst of, of all of the unknown that's in our lives right now, could we, just, could we just stop and ask for God's discernment with all of this and know and be confident that he will give that to us? Because that's what he desires of us. Know that the Spirit of God will direct us where to go and what to do and what to give and how to give and how to love our neighbors through all of this stuff and not going too far and not, not, not doing anything. Not harming anybody, but protecting them. What can we have, God? How can we do this? Give us wisdom in the midst of this. That's what we are praying all the time here at the church. God, lead us, direct us, give us discernment of how to navigate through these things. And so that's the first thing today, that we need to be praying for discernment of the Spirit of God for ourselves, for our families, for our leaders and elders within this church for our leaders within the community and within our country, for our health care workers that are on the front lines day in and day out, for all of those, those teachers who have continued to, to jump through all of the hoops to try to teach our kids from distance learning, right? I hope you all really enjoyed that first week of it. I know it was a roller coaster for us. But we just pray that God would give us the wisdom that we need to walk through this time. It's what Solomon asked for. And God promises that when we seek him out, he will overwhelm us with his wisdom. There's an illustration of the discernment of what Solomon got here at the end of chapter 3 involving two women and a child. It actually began as two children, but one of them died. And the two ladies come in and they start arguing over whose child is still alive. And they start going back and forth and they can't decide and they, they're getting in arguments. And so they, they go to King Solomon to say, hey, you're, you've got this wisdom thing going. Help us out here. Whose son is this? And he goes, I got, I got it. He goes, bring me the child and bring me a sword. And what we're going to do is we're going to chop him in half and you'll each get a half. Well, immediately the, the real mom says, no, 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 no. This is, this is my baby. I, I would rather see him alive than see him dead and so go ahead and take him in all of Solomon's wisdom he says that is the real mother and he gives the child back to the real mother I was talking to my kids about this this doesn't necessarily work all that great uh, with your kids at home when they're arguing uh, you know you can't like chop the tv in half or chop the computer screen in half and and give those pieces away because that would actually drive the parents more insane than probably the kids right 
Uh, and then it doesn't, doesn't really work when they're arguing and, and you just try to take things away, which is kind of our nature. Okay, well, you're not going to get to do that or that or that. Because then they start arguing and blaming each other as to how or who got them in trouble and who got them uh, eliminated off of those things. And so the reality for all of us is, Lord, for the love of all that is holy, please give us wisdom and discernment to parent through all of this chaos. We pray that for you. Please pray that for us as well. Continuing on, chapter 4, verse 29, it says this. God gave Solomon wisdom and every great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. It says that he'll be smarter than anyone else on the planet and kind of walks through a list of some of the things that he had great understanding of. Verse 32 of chapter 4, it says, he spoke 3,000 proverbs. And his songs numbered a thousand and five. He spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He spoke, he also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his great wisdom. If you want to read through some of that wisdom of King Solomon, there there are three books that are associated with him that, that he was Uh, spoken of as to written these books. One is most of the book of Proverbs are the wisdom statements of King Solomon. And then there's Song of Solomon or Song of Songs that's attributed to him. And then Ecclesiastes as well. And they're all given to him. And they're they're unique studies, each one in their own. And we're going to talk about what they look like in just a little bit. But specifically, Proverbs is one of those that that combines these deep and spiritual truths, these, these truth statements that many people will memorize because they still ring true today. You see, the wisdom of Solomon was on display for everyone. So Solomon asks for wisdom, he's granted that, and then God just continues to build from there. King Solomon goes on to build the temple of the Lord in chapter 6 of 1 Kings. Remember, this was something that David wanted to do. King David, his father, he wanted to build a temple for God's presence to come and be in, but he said, no, no, that's for your child, the next king, and this is actually where it comes to fruition. In chapter 7, it holds the construction of his great palace, another work of majesty that he puts together, an incredible construction site. And then in chapter 8, he places the Ark of the Covenant, God's very presence that's been traveling with the Israelites. It finally comes to rest in its place of honor, in its home, in the temple. You see, King Solomon, he, he solidifies his kingdom, and through his discernment and all of these incredible gifts that God has given to him, he builds on his wisdom, and he builds on his wealth, and he builds these, these monuments of, of honor and faithfulness to God amongst everything. But much like all the rest, there's a turn that kind of happens within his life, and a shift from the desires of God to his own desires. And slowly it all starts to crumble away. And it was, among other things, a woman issue, just like his father. Except this was a little bit of a different soap opera here. Uh, it was mostly, most certainly against what God had commanded him to not do. You see, the Lord was specific with regards to who the Israelites should marry. And everybody kind of took that and ran with it. But while God lays out different people groups that the Israelites, he did not want them to intermarry with. And so many people have taken this. I want you to hear this very carefully. This has nothing to do with racial lines. Has nothing to do with that. What God knew was that these other groups of people who worshipped other gods and had other belief systems, if they were to come into the Israelite nation as family, then those belief statements and they would, would come and they would start to lead people away from God. And so King Solomon really didn't care about that command. And he took it upon himself to love and marry many women from all over the known world, completely aside from the will of God for his life. At the end of verse 2 in chapter 11 of 1 Kings, it says this, Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines and his wives led him astray. I thought you said this guy was smart, right? (laughs) That is a handful. As Solomon grew old, look at this, his wives turned his heart after other gods. It was exactly what God had warned. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord 
his God, as the heart of David, his father, had been. And while his consequences for this sin are laid out before him, they aren't enacted until after he is gone. But those were that the kingdom was going to be torn apart. It was slowly going to unravel before the watchful eyes of his children. There would be forever difficulties because of the influence of all these other gods and all these other idols that came into the people of God. And while the line of David would remain intact, that line that does lead us down to Jesus, adversaries from all over began to come forth into the nation of Israel, which he'd never known during his reign. But watch how this works as well in his life because here's another way that sin gets a hold of us so easily. Pay close attention to this because while King David's sin was something that happened and then it quickly snowballed into again and again and again, so often we find ourselves in these situations with King Solomon. It appears that King Solomon's was a slow progression, a slow walk away from God. You see, it began with disobedience to a commandment that God had given to them. You see, in his mind, King Solomon could justify it, right? And so many of us, let me tell you, when we have sins in our life, don't we just try to justify them away? Don't we just try to to put them off as it'll be okay? It's not that bad. How many times have we said to ourselves, oh, it's not that bad? King Solomon's was was political reasons. Oh, if I can have all of these wives of, of royalty from all over the place, then my kingdom slash God's kingdom will continue to grow, and my people slash God's people will continue to grow. And so was there, was, there was this pride issue is really what it boils down to, because King Solomon thought, well, I knew better. I know better than what God has for us. I can remain strong in my relationship with God, even though I'm kind of dabbling in all of these other things. But then as time goes on, his heart is slowly turned away from God towards these other things. And then the most difficult piece here, and this is what you and I need to be very careful with. It it says this, did you hear it? His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord. Now be careful. So he he didn't fully turn away from God. He just wasn't sold out anymore. There were other things in his life that kind of took precedence here. I think the priorities for King Solomon, depending on the day, depending on the wife, depending on whoever else was influencing him, those became his priorities. And so God was was still a part of his life, but he wasn't life itself any longer. And herein lies the danger. You see, when you have so much going on in your life that all these other things, your wisdom and wealth and fame and comfort and passions kind of take over priority, then God does not have his rightful place in our lives anymore. And that for Solomon had consequences for generations to come, and it could for you and I as well. Look at the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation towards the very end of scripture. It says that they were neither hot nor cold and so the Lord was spitting them out of his mouth. He wants devoted, dedicated followers of Jesus Christ, fully devoted, fully given over. Listen, when we are in a time when all of these things All of these things that that we are desiring and that we are going after that are a part of this world, so many of them are slowly being stripped away from us. And so at the end of the day, what do we have left? What is it that we have left? Where is the meaning of life coming from for all of us now? Because when you look at the overview of King Solomon's life, you look through all of those readings that we talked about, look at how it progresses. The book of Proverbs just kind of celebrates his wisdom and knowledge and understanding and gives us all of these little nuggets to, to memorize and really implement into our lives. But then the book of the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs is a distinction of marriage and passion and it boils out of that entire text. It contains some of the metaphors that, that sound more like late night poems for us that would make most of us blush quite a bit if we actually read them to each other. That stuff really does mean what you think it means when you read through the book, which tells you where he was at in his life when he wrote it. And then the book of Ecclesiastes kind of drops the hammer. It's the, the end of his journey, the end of his life here on earth, 
And he's looking back and he's reflecting. And after all of what he's seen and all of what he's had and all of what he's experienced, he reflects for all of us to be able to learn from. As the wisest man in the known world in biblical times, it says this. He says in chapter 1, to pursue wisdom for knowledge is meaningless. To pursue wisdom for the sake of only having knowledge and only growing in your understanding of all of the things, if that's the end point, it is meaningless. Chapter 2, he says, pleasures of this life are meaningless. He says, the folly and the fun and the craziness of this life is meaningless. He says, toil and hard work are meaningless. Chapter 4, he says, advancement is meaningless. Hear that? Advancement is meaningless. Growing your own brand is meaningless. And then chapter 5, he says, riches. From the richest man in the world, he says, riches are meaningless. He says repeatedly over and over again how meaningless our lives are when they are not dedicated to the God that gives us meaning in the first place. The rest of will be what we intended them to be. But if it's not in the meaning of God, if it's not God being the first and foremost priority for us, all of the rest of these things that come our way are meaningless before Him. And that's what King Solomon comes to at the end of his days. He concludes with these words, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Just watch it on the screen here. Verse 13, he says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, And keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. And then he says, For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. The the wisest man, the, the, the smartest man, the most discerning man, the man that has all of the riches, the man that has all of the honor, gets to this point in his life and he says, all of the things that you've been hiding, all of the things that you have, have, have laid before God, all of those things mean nothing without God. And so what are our quick takeaways here today from King Solomon and the walk through, uh, briefly through his life? First one is this, pray for discernment. Pray for discernment, pray for wisdom. But we don't pray for it. We continually seek it. We continue to ask for it. We continue to knock on the doors of knowledge so that we may grow closer to God first and foremost and understanding what he would have for the rest of our lives. We pray for discernment. We, we don't pursue knowledge for knowledge's sake as if that were our king in this world. But we pursue knowledge for the kingdom of God to be impacted both within ourselves and with those around us. So we pray for discernment. The second thing is we recognize that God gives immeasurably more. When we are pursuing God, our prayers are always answered. Maybe not in the manner that we pray for them to be, or the time frame that we would like them to be, or even the many times that God is saying no to us through our prayers, but is always working. God is always moving in the midst of our lives, and he's doing that in immeasurable ways. King Solomon asked for wisdom, and God went above and beyond all of that with wealth and honor. Ephesians chapter 3, there's, there's this beautiful prayer that asks that we would know God's love. God, that you would reveal your love to us because your love surpasses all knowledge. And that by knowing that love, we would be filled with the fullness of God. And that we would know that he can do immeasurably more through that love than we could ever ask or imagine. And we know this to be true. That's because we sit on the other side of the cross of Jesus. We can look back and say, with everything that we've given, nothing compares to Jesus Christ in our lives. It gives us true meaning. It gives us everything and more that we could ever ask for or imagine. No matter where we have the rest of our pursuits within our lives, we have the hope of Jesus Christ going first and foremost before us because God gave us him who is immeasurably more. And so we ask for discernment, and we recognize that God has given us immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. And then the third thing is this, is to be fully devoted to God. Be fully devoted to God. We have to be at a point with everything else fades away, with everything else walking away, with everything else being taken away at this point, and it will, we'll continue to see some of these things within our lives, God still holds precedence within us. God is still the number one above everything else. And not only that, 
But when all of those things are able to come back into the forefront of our lives, and those things are, are very blatant in front of us, and, and the wealth and the honor and the prestige and all of those things, and even getting out and traveling and, and all the excitement that's going to come in that day, we recognize that those things are not going to get in the way of us being fully devoted to our Lord. You see, through the mountaintops and through the valleys, in the king's palace or in the servant's quarters, having everything and having nothing, we recognize that we need to be fully devoted to a God who is our creator, who is our covenant giver, who's our promise keeper, who's our giant slayer, who's our way maker, our true king of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. It is King Jesus. And because of that, we can be fully devoted to God. We can recognize that he gives us immeasurably more through Jesus Christ. And as we see that, we pray for discernment to get through all of these things that we're navigating in these times. And so I just want to close us out with a proverb, one of those proverbs from King Solomon. He says this, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord. If this is an encouragement to you today, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and his kingship within our lives and he will make our paths straight. We pray that over ourselves. We pray that over you. That as we continue to dive into God's word, we continue to see the truths that come out of that. We pray that through all of this, we would trust in our God. We would trust in the Lord with everything that we have. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to just um, be involved in your words. God, I pray that you would give us that courage to stick to what we believe, to not slowly fade away, to not slowly walk away and be engulfed by all these other things, but continue to put you as first and foremost in our lives. God, continue to pursue you and acknowledge the immeasurable gift that you have given to us in Jesus Christ. God, we pray in this moment for your wisdom, your discernment, your knowledge, that as we seek out your words, God, you speak to us through your spirit and give us the courage to lead lives according to that. God, we love you and praise you. It's in your son's name that we do pray. Amen. Where the 
Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We can lift our eyes to Jesus. Oh, there is freedom. We lift our eyes to Jesus. Listen, everyone, as we celebrate and sing about the freedom that we have in God, the freedom that we have in Christ, we are embarking this week on something special. Today is actually Palm Sunday, where we celebrate Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem, and we walk through this entire week called Passion Week as we head towards Easter. I'm going to talk about Easter in just a little bit, but we have some things we want you to know that are coming your way. This whole week, starting at 11 o'clock today, uh, you will begin seeing notifications through our Facebook what we're calling Virtual Passion Week. And so every moment of this next week that's recorded in Scripture on Jesus' journey to the cross, to the grave, and to resurrection is going to come up on a, a, a text or on a message through our Facebook page so that we can understand where Jesus is at and what he's doing throughout this coming week. We can pray through that and it can just soak into our lives. It's something that we got from another pastor friend of ours. And so we're going to walk through that and give that to you so we can all recognize what's going on throughout this. It's called Virtual Passion Passion Week, and we want to just offer that to you all as well. Along with that, this Friday is Good Friday. 
Now, we typically will celebrate that with a service here of communion. That's why we did not partake in communion this morning. But what uh, we want to do is we just want to set aside a brief time on Friday night at 7 o'clock. We're going to post a little uh, communion moment. And if you want to have some juice ready and some crackers ready uh, to partake in communion together as a church family, it's coming at 7 o'clock on Friday night this coming week. We'd love to have you come and join us uh, with that as well. We'll send that out through our Facebook. We'll send that out through email so your family can can be a part of that. It doesn't have to be uh, the special bread or the the special grape juice. It just has to be uh, elements where we are going to honor God together and reflect on the cross of Jesus Christ that he is Uh, ready to get to uh, on that particular day. And so we're going to pray through that. We're going to walk through that. It'll just be a brief little uh, five to ten minute devotional thought from me Friday night for Good Friday. And then next Sunday is going to be our Easter celebration. It's going to be a little bit different uh, here online than what we typically uh, would be, but we are walking along with everybody else and trying to figure out how we can best honor God in this. And so I would encourage you to invite friends to watch us online. Invite friends to come because it will be a specific message targeted towards the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the hope that we all have in him. And so we want everyone to hear that message, even though it's a unique way from normal we want everybody to know so continue to invite people to to log on to get connected to even join a a Facebook watch party with you from the comfort of their own home we would love to have everybody join us for Easter Sunday that is next Sunday already man it's been coming quick hasn't it and then finally for our children next Sunday uh, we have a special event that's coming to you through our curriculum orange curriculum they have given to us it's called Easter Jam 2020, and uh, many of you from Grace Point family would know we do a jingle jam at Christmas time, and they have produced an Easter jam that's got some activities and some games at the beginning of the video, and then it's got the story of Jesus Christ um, told for kids to understand to the best way possible. It is incredible. I watched it this past week. Uh, Your kids are going to love it. My kids are going to love it. We would love for you to participate in that with us as well. That'll be our curriculum for Easter Sunday. So make sure you're logging on. Make sure you're joining us. Make sure you're checking Facebook and checking those emails for updates that we're sending out. Uh, We would just love to have you even stay more connected with us as we try to stay connected to God through all of this. Let me pray for us as we head out for today. God, thank you so much for the chance to come and worship you. God, I, I just ask that you would be honored, be glorified, and be worshiped today and every day. God, give us the wisdom to navigate through all of this. God, allow us the courage to be fully devoted to you, no matter what. And God, we thank you above and beyond anything and everything that we could ask or imagine for your son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice that we celebrate every day, but we will focus on throughout this entire week. God, we love you and praise you and thank you. It's in your son's beautiful name, Jesus, that we do pray. Amen. Have a great Sunday.